So we've got so many people trying to do some automated code review, right? Yeah. 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 You, you have no time to do code review, so you expect something else to do it. We ever tried to do a code review with an elephant? <laughs> no. No. They're very mean. They're very mean. But there's so many actually. I, that's, why I, I, that's why I started working on static analysis. So I'm very happy to see that there are so many people here tonight. Um, we're going to spend the, the hour trying to review code without actually reading it and giving that to PHP itself, maybe, and having it uh, give us a number of information and insights on what's in, in the code. So, most, that, will, that would be mainly two parts. Uh, the first one, I'm going to give you a number of more theoretical de in the details on how a static analyzer works. Maybe not all of them, but I know there are several authors of static analyzer. I think we can count you as one, maybe. Yeah, somewhat. Well, you use that. There's Andre. There's... You do some more. So, I'm, I really have to watch my, my language tonight. Pardon my French. Um, and then in the second part, before, after I'm, I'm done boring you with the theoretical detail, we'll, start, we'll dive into actual uh, practical uh, applications and what it can do with you. I have actually a list of 68 of them, and we have 60 minutes, right? That's going to be fast. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm actually the official travel agent of the oldest uh, elephant ever. Um, yeah, we bring it a bit everywhere, not exactly this one, but another of his sons. And um, beside that, I also do static analyzing as a CTO every day. So, that's exactly from where my uh, experience is coming and what I'm going to explain to you tonight. Um, besides doing the audit itself, you probably have set yourself, unless you're a CTO, uh, in the position where you're, you're coding you know, with uh, brand new technology, and then you have this specific line of code, maybe one of the 1,000 lines of code you have in the script, and you start asking yourself a number of questions before you move to the next one, right? Is it, um, is it a good, good line of code? Is it fast? Hey, come back. Is it fast? Is it, um, is it compatible? Because, well, after fast, usually we ask ourselves if it's compatible. Uh, is it secure also? Because that's usually business requirements. And you're still on the same line, right? Asking more and more questions coming up. Um, why, not, uh, why not use a framework? Why is it stuck? Yeah. Uh, should I use that? And you have suddenly all those questions because this is a number of uh, recommendations you can remember from various authors, various experts, maybe other languages, and you don't know when to stop, okay? So you end up with a final question. And then you want to have a review. You want to have someone look at that code and say, oh, yeah, good idea, not bad idea, or discuss it or something like that. Though you go to conferences. PHP is doing the job, and you've learned most of the time things like that. There are three steps. What you call, actually, PHP code is a text file. Initially, it's just a bunch of bytes together that makes sense to PHP, hopefully, maybe also for you. But that's the way it works. Then Derek comes, and he just turns that into opcode. Yeah, with his little hands. And then we send that to the Zend engine, which actually executes that. That's the three usual steps. And that's not exactly the one we are interested in. In between, we have something that looks like static analysis, but is not. It's coding convention. This is the moment where you decide that you want to make spaces around your egg wall operator, because it looks better. That is be completely useless for this end engine in the end. It doesn't care about that. It doesn't care about comments, it doesn't care how beautiful your code is, because it's just text. And it will do something from the opcode, not from your text. Okay, so we're not going to talk about that. PHP docs, commons, white spaces, not for us. We want things that will be executed. Now, this three layers cake is something common in other languages because they have the, com the compilation from the text. They start with the same origin than us, okay, looking a little bit different, but they start from the same origin. They do have compilation, you know, they call it JCC or Java C or whatever you call it. Maybe it's kind of hidden, but it's there. And then they have some intermediate code that can run. In PHP, we don't have that. Actually, it's there, but it's kind of hidden. So static analysis will actually have to be set as a side branch, because the result of the static analyzing will be probably the report, whatever it 
whatever shape it will have. And we are going to fit that into us so we can go back to the code, fix it, and ultimately make the code better. Okay? So it's kind of a different branch we have. And the thing is, initially, PHP is doing already a part of this static analyzing. Okay? Who's using linting? Oh, good. That will be fast. So when we moved from PHP 5 to PHP 7, we got that code, and suddenly it went wrong. Why? Two defaults, yes. Yeah, that's too easy for you. You'll answer that later. There are two defaults. It, until PHP 7, it was actually code that could work. Just the second default was completely removed, right? Completely ignored. The first one was the one that was found and executed. Kind of simple here. So linting is already a good static analyzer. If you're on PHP 5 and you want to keep using PHP 5, don't do that, but if you really want, you can run PHP 7 static uh, linting and get a lot more details about the way your code behaves on PHP 5. And just fixing that will do two things in the same time. Prepare your code for PHP 7 and make your PHP 5 code better. So that's a good start. But that's, that's very easy, actually. PHP is, is not doing a lot of job here, right? There's another set of problems that looks like the same that should be also PHP uh, telling us what's wrong or what should not be here. How many cases do we have here? Depending on why, of course. How many different cases do we have here? Zero? One? Five? Two? <coughs> zero? Twelve? Just one. All of them are the same. All of them are the same. Actually, x is compared with the double equal. And beside that, after the case, well, most of the time we just put a constant or literal. But you could actually have anything that's an expression that will return you a result. So the first one is the integer, easy. The second one would be called like a static expression, almost. So it's something that could be prepared at uh, compile time. The third one is a string, but since the string contains an integer, PHP will actually do the conversion. True will be converted, and K and real will be converted, and of course, depending on why, it will be also compared the same. So all of them are the same, but PHP do not mention anything about that. You, you lint it and say, okay, yeah, we can try that. Why is it? Why is it it understands that there are two defaults and it yells about it, and suddenly those breaks, are all the, those cases are all the same, and just say nothing. The problem is this has to be re, um, solved at execution time. Okay? Uh, PP could actually do some work because some of the literals here could be solved at compilation time. But in doubt, it just said, it just leave that on the side. It doesn't do anything. This is where static analysis will start working. This is where it says, I can do and solve a number of those situations and report that at least half of them are, uh, are the same and they should be removed. So how does Static analysis work in general if you want to avoid regex, which means that you're treating your text file just as another text file. You want to go up a little, take a little you know, distance and include more meaning, more semantics into the, in the, the reading. And for that, you need to first take the files, process them with the tokenizer. So who among you has been using the tokenizer? Okay, you've done it, that's another problem. One. Okay, so I'm going to rephrase the question. Who among you have been using PHP? And I see still a number of people who are too shy to raise their head. <laughs> the tokenizer is the first part. Whenever you execute something in PHP, the tokenizer takes the file, then breaks that into tokens, and then push the tokens to another part of the PHP that runs it. Okay? But those tokens are exactly the words that PHP can understand. If you ever learn any Chinese, where you have quickly learned that there is no space, every word are the same next to each other. There's no delimitation between words. You have to learn how to read the words and say, okay, oh, this, is, this makes sense. Oh, if I add one, does it make sense? So a black track, that's one word, next word. Here's the same. The tokenizer will do the job of finding this is a space, this is common, this is a string, this is a parenthesis. How does that look like? 
it looks like a huge array filled with lots of Kabbalistic numbers. This very simple piece of code that was even shortened to be really uh, available leads you to this number of uh, tokens. It's just an array, all flattened, with other arrays or simple, simple literals. So you can find here the define is around there. That doesn't work so well. Uh, before the uh, 382 is actually a uh, white space, depending on the PHP version. You have the parentheses, you have another uh, literal, you have the comma, you have... That's, that's everything PHP is going to, to give you with, from the tokenizer. Uh, the first thing you learn when doing that is you can get rid of the first third of all the token. One third of the token are completely useless. As I said, comments, doc comments, and space. Everything can get rid of because no one cares about that. The second third that can get rid of, actually, it's not us that's going to get rid of it, but it's everything that is a delimiter. Okay, parentheses in general is useful for the tokenizer to understand where is what, but in the end, we don't care about them. Okay? Because in the end, we're going to remove all this long list, long log of tokens into an abstract syntactic tree. So I'm going to just call that AST because it's difficult to pronounce. Please, thank you. Um, it's an abstract syntactic tree, AST, and the previous file, or this is one that you can guess actually just by reading, you have at the top the file. The file has one, one script which includes code, a code has a number of sequence, including and one use, two different uh, classes, and two or three, uh, three calls. Okay? So the previous tokens have now been reordered and reorganized. Every, every element is in its place. The variable may be a part of a function, it may be an, an argument or not, it may be a, 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 a literal, everything has its own place. And we just have one third of the tokens. That's excellent because at that point we, we do not have to follow and read the code one line after each other, which is what we do as humans, but we have blocks. All the functions makes one block. There is the big block of function, the sequence, and the arguments, and the name. We have everything defined. Um, the classes are gathering constant properties and functions. They're all together at one place. So all the definitions are, are in place, which means that we can start working on things a little more complex like that. Here you have one class that's defined, instantiated, and you have, uh, you have a call on it. Okay, very simple, nothing, nothing really uh, wizardry. Um, you, can, you can see from the, the, the AST, well, the order of the elements is there, but the important part is that we have the class and the, the tool can actually link the, the instantiation to the definition. So now we have a way to move from the last, well, the next to the last line, to the definition and go on again and find other elements inside the code. That's one way. We don't have to read the thing one after each other. We can start, go to the definition, do so, find something else, come back, or maybe go somewhere else. The only thing we're starting to miss at that point, besides the definition, is the order in which it's executed. Because basically, the element you have here is not, are not in the same order than the one you have here. It's probably in the information, but the AST kind of loses this information. So we have to start thinking on top of the AST about flow control. Flow control is a diagram that will take care of the order, the sequence order of execution. Here is another example. You will, again, pardon my French, the slides are in French at that moment, so probably you're going to learn something. Um, here is a, a very little, little script. There is a, 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 a source that's um, there, and then there is an if. The if has two branches, which means that you should not navigate both of them at the same time. That's exactly what you want from a if, right? If there is a condition met, then you do something, otherwise you go on the else if it's there. The AST will probably look at that. Well, will look like that. And the other diagram we want would be a, con a flow control graph that looks like that. Slightly different from the previous one, right? This time, we want to know the order in which everything is executed. The first one is a common path. It's al always done, so it's right after the, the, the initial call on PHP. The second one is uh, the condition itself. So at that point, we know we have branching. And then we have the two branches at each, uh, on, on each side, which will merge ultimately, well, here at the exit, because it's a very simple example, but they will merge and maybe go on with something else. 
That's another way to navigate the information, right? Initially, we had the definition. Now we have a way to navigate just the way PHP is going to execute the information. Okay? It may branch depending on situation and state. Yeah, that's a state machine. We branch on one side, on the other, and that would be the same for every part of the code. And it's completely independent from the definition we've seen earlier. There's completely, it's completely moving from one flow diagram to the other one is completely arbitrary. And actually, before we start going to other tools, I would like to introduce you with another, what's, what I found the definition as a program dependency graph. But that's again the same script you have here that's applying the dependencies on the data. So it's not anymore the sequence that's important. That's how you need other statements to be executed before you reach this one. So take a look at the first one. The first one is unconditional because, well, you have nothing, okay? Source is something that exists, at least we can check it easily. There's a function called that. It returns something, so feeding x is okay. Now, if we move along, along the script, of course, if we want to execute the if and the condition, then we only have to execute the previous one. So this, this um, how say that? This uh, sequence is always valid. When we want to move inside the else, then we have two dependencies. We need x to exist, so it has to be depending on the first source. And it also needs that x has a special condition. So to reach that point, yeah, of course, we need to follow the, the control flow. But we also have to meet a special condition, which is that x is smaller than 10, which also means that probably x can be you know, uh, identified as, a, as an integer. And then, then we can go on, which means that, for example, if y is not ex existing here on the else, we can understand that the two branches are unbalanced. Anything that will use y after the, um, after the if then could then rely, go, go through one of the bench that has not set a y, and then that would be a problem. I'm not sure I'm clear, but... So here, the, the dependency dep is, is a list of things that the data has to be prepared before reaching that point. And that includes the conditions. So in the end, we have three different ways to navigate inside the code. One thing you learn from static analysis is that you keep constantly moving from one paradigm to the other. The first one you have here is, well, we want X, we want the source. Where is the source? What does it do? Does it really bring us an integer? Then we use AST. AST will tell us where in the, in the code is the source. It may not look like, like that. Maybe I have a use statement before that send that into a namespace that we haven't heard about. But HT will tell that us. Then we get the value. It goes there. Which of the, uh, of the path will be followed? And which sequence will be executed? That's from the, the program dependency and uh, the flow graph. Yes? Is uh, y equals x should be depend dependent on the if? Yes, it also depends. Um, Yes, it also depends, yeah, right, you're right, it's missing. Uh, it's the contrary, yeah, yeah, it's the other uh, condition. It's the, the you're right, it's missing, the, the link, this, this link, this is dying, this link is, uh, should also be there, I, I missed it. It actually should be the contrary, right? So this x, I don't see it, this one here depends directly on the condition, the other one here depends on the negation of the condition because it's the else. You, this is missing the, the link, yeah, in the, in the, in the schema. Um, so, in between, in the end, um, we can consider actually PHP as a database. PHP code is a data set. Now, it's kind of the contrary of what we have uh, usually. Usually, we have the data set, and no, we have the query language, like SQL or Gremlin, and we, we want the data to query it, right? Here we have the data set, but we have no way to query it. We don't know how to query that, right? We can execute it, PHP will make sense of that, run it, do something, but how can we go inside and, and collect the information we want, okay? So we need, we need a, a list of, um, we, need, we need the tools to do that, and they have different approaches. So I have a list of, well, I have currently 68 of them. I checked the, the slide this morning, which makes me uh, discover another three of them. So thank you for the conference. That's, uh, that's an upgrade. And I'm not going to show you all of them, but I would like to show you a number of them broken down in five categories. And there are others. There are a lot other categories, 
and hopefully you can even you know, imagine yours. Uh, migration tools, code quality, security, metrics, and inventories. That should cover a number of elements, okay? So how come migration tools um, are interested in static analysis, okay? Um, what happens when you want to move to PHP from PHP 5 to PHP 7? Well, there's uh, only one source. You go in the manual, and the manual tells you, okay, these classes disappeared, those are new. Um, these functions disappeared, those are new, and those have changed their behavior. Ooh. Um, so getting rid of something is usually easy. You know what you're losing, right? So it was there, it's not anymore, so if it appears in the code, then you have to remove it. Changing behavior is a lot more difficult. And how many pages of documentation do you have at the moment for, to migrate from five to seven? Shall we try the guess again? 12 pages? Seven. <laughs> seven, that's a good guess. That means that I don't want to see PHP 100. <laughs> so there's a, there's a huge list of them, right? It would be probably easy to talk about one or two of them now, but there's a long list, there's different situations, and sometimes it's very difficult to actually track them in the code. For example, disappearing classes, okay, that's an easy one. Disappearing directive, oh. How can you track disappearing directive? You cannot track directly the code unless the code itself is dependent, like core set, default core set we changed, that's uh, appeared in PHP 5.5. This one actually has an impact now on HTML entities and HTML special cores. And the other one, there's uh, the decode table. So sometimes it's kind of difficult. And there, static analysis can collect, can capitalize all those different elements, all those different sources, and make that into one element, in one place. So at least the two first uh, static analyzer I heard that were completely specific on moving from five to seven, and probably just seven because they were not updated ever since, or PHP 7 more, PHP 7 CC. For those of you who said yes when I asked uh, about uh, staying in PHP 5, then you can use those. Otherwise, the one I work on, for example, will give you reports like that. Remember, we're talking about static analysis, so there's no fear into using PHP 7.2. Even 7.2 is not yet there, right? Um, I kind of have to change the name if suddenly they decide to move from 7.2 to 8. I guess that's worth it, right? There's already a number of things. There's probably like 12, no, less than that, six different RFCs that were voted. So we already have a number of things that are uh, available for PHP 7.2. And even though we don't compile it, we can check for them. So there's, of course, a number of things. Um, the de remove directives, um, there, is new, there, are, there are new functions. There are new, um, uh, new function that appears. Um, there are uh, extensions that disappears. There are things we cannot test currently. Okay, so it's also written there. And there are things um, that uh, also are already the, uh, wrong, so we, can, we, we should actually take a look at that and prepare the code for PHP 7.2. Okay? So this is just the, the whole report on the, on, the, on, the, on the migration itself. There are more details. Each time you have uh, the name of the file, the, the, the name of the file, the file line, and the problem that's uh, linked to it. Others? Code quality, hmm. code quality tools. Um, so besides migration, besides knowing what to do between one version to another, then um, there's code quality, so things that are evergreens, okay? You try to use um, a property, but the property is not defined. Well, that, that's usually the problem. It doesn't really hurt the code, right? Because PHP will still run with it. But for example, if you create a standard object, std object, and create the classes, that will be actually slower than making an array and then casting the wall of it into an, an object at the end. Little things like that. So probably if you do not create a class, um, de define a class, you're going to have little you know, performance loss at the time. It's really tedious to review the code all the time for missing uh, definition of properties or things like that. So probably a tool is going to do that a lot better than you, for you. And especially it's not going to get bored at testing all the code all the time. So um, there's several of them. I chose PHP Stand because we have the author here. So it's nice if you have extra question, you can also go and meet him. Uh, Fan was started by Rasmus. 
So it's interesting because it uh, raised the um, attention on unit on uh, static analysis. It's still being uh, worked on uh, heavily every day, probably uh, from Etsy. So they're using that over there, and it's open source. All the tools here are open source. Psalm come from Vimeo, I think. So that's that's another company that's outsourcing it their own tool. Here is a result from PHP Stan. I had to adapt the presentation because it doesn't fit nicely, and I also removed the redundant one. But again, you see the file name, you got the line, and each time you have an explanation that says, okay, this is what I found that is wrong. Collection of them, there is a class that is not found, possibly because of misconfiguration. So Autoload couldn't find the class, or maybe it's in Composer. There is missing uh, functions also. Um, what is, well, is, is interesting there? Oh, missing uh, variables. So undefined variable, probably one of those variables that's being used before it's actually uh, initialized and get a, a, a value in it. Again, it doesn't really always urge, but if you know what they are, you go on that line, fix it, and then save it. That's done. Good enough? So some more. Hmm. Security tools. Of course, you can have some others that are specific to security. And if we've seen um, the previous one that uh, go on uh, security on the uh, code quality, they usually rely heavily on the AST because of definitions. Uh, security tools usually rely on uh, checking where the value goes and when it is filtered. Here you have a few of them. RIPS has been actually around for a long, long time. Um, I mentioned the 05 because it's the last uh, version they have that's available as open source. Now it's a SaaS. Probably the, they're the same guy, they just upgraded uh, infrastructure. Okay. I don't know if the 05 works anymore in 7, to be true. But at least you can take a look at the code. And they work heavily on that because uh, this kind of schema um, allows them to provide you, uh, they, they, they look for um, the link between a sink, so a place where the security may have trouble, and the origin, which is usually the incoming variables. Okay. And in between, sometimes the, the path is not easy, that's one thing, and there are lots of conditions. So in the end, they can tell you, okay, from here, this goes into the MySQL query, okay, and there are those conditions. When you can meet all those conditions, then you have a vulnerability. That's an interesting result. PCQ is working directly on the code. See, it looks actually a lot like uh, PHP stand, same, uh, same result, except the, uh, the order is more like one line, one result. Um, you have the name of the file, you have the line, the explanation, which may be actually longer, more documentation, and you have an extract of the code that is being used. Okay? So for example, in the middle, we have avoid the use exit and because it leads to injection, and apparently the out file is displayed. No, there's no exit mentioned. Hmm. Okay, on the last one, header should not be done with concatenation. <laughs> Sorry for that, the concatenation is on the other side. Trust me on that. Okay, so let's say the first one mentioned uh, well, the usage of requests any, anywhere, and uh, yes, generally speaking, you don't want to leave any requests uh, anywhere. Metrics. Metrics, I not always consider them as, um, as static analysis because they will give broader results, telling you, okay, cyclomatic complexity is way too high, so please don't take, uh, take a look there, but they will not point an exact line, so it won't, it's broader. It's still kind of interesting. And here is a bunch of them. And the, the PHP metrics one has been around, and it's especially pretty nice. So it's nice looking. It fits very well in reports whenever you have to, to do one of them. Um, there is the number of lines of code on one side and the cyclomatic complexity here. So the, the way the, the dots are scattered are always very interesting. Okay. Here, um, there is obviously one major uh, class that reached 345, and a bunch of them that intermediate, and a lot of them that are really small and very simple. This is characteristic of a framework approach. Okay, so obviously there is the senior guys who build four, five big classes that suddenly explode in terms of complexity because they are always extended 
and two components. And the components are done by people who are not the senior ones, but they have to write you know, the classes, extend the, the main one, and call APIs uh, on, the, on this. So suddenly you have this huge class, which cannot be broken down for monolith uh, approach problems. And all the others are smaller. So you can also see that on the other side. You see this ring of green and simple classes, other one done by the juniors, and obviously the one in the middle is the, the framework <laughs> approach. But that's kind of interesting to see. It's kind of visual. Of course, there are other, other classes all around. And another one that can be done by PHP metrics, which is more static analysis, is this. Uh, this. They actually collected all the methods and they make a link between the method and the calling one. Obviously, this does not fit in a session here, and I should be moving my, 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 my mouse over, every, over a, uh, every link so I could see which one is linked. But the general presentation is actually interesting to analyze. If you take a look at that, there are a few of them that are obviously concentrating a lot of calls. Again, that's the same code. So we understand that what we've seen with cyclomatic complexity appears here again. Some of the uh, wide range of, of components are calling only the same uh, classes, and those are the ones we should review. At least we know how to navigate and, and which part of the code we should take a look at. Hmm. Actually, pretty quick. So inventories will be the last section. And inventories is something that I, I really enjoy. It's always spectacular to, uh, to do one of them. Um, basically, it takes, you take one of a part of the, of the code. For example, you, you list all the, all the literals, and you see how often they appear. And suddenly, you take a look at the value and understand why some special value appears. If you look at a PHP code that, has, that makes usage of 3,600, uh, 3, what's that? Yeah, well, not only, but yeah, most of the time it's, it's something like that. So does it have to be hour coded or could it be put in a constant so it makes sense in the code? Because otherwise, all the numbers do not always make sense. Suddenly there is a, what was that the last time I've seen? 18, 1800, 19. That appears all over the code. What is that? 18, 19? That was apparently a port on a radius server. Anyone using that? I learned that too. But all the others, and it makes sense, like 389, that's a, a port I, I know, so okay, I let, it, I let it go. I think it's the LDAP one. And at some point, so many of these magic number was appearing across the code because they decided to outcode some of the ports. Okay, so that's, that's interesting to see and to, to have the literal just taken out of context and see how often they are you probably don't want to review any zero and one because they appear to too many situations. But otherwise, the ones that are kind of weird appear several times, they're interested. Um, before we, we move on, let's take a look at, the, at this one, error messages. Make a selection of all the error messages that are being used in exit. Just extract like, them like that. That and exceptions. And list them and try to see what that does. Anyone knows PHP IPM? This is the, the, the application that was, no, no. Can you tell me what they do from the error messages from there? Just reading in the error messages. This is when something is wrong, they stop, they make an exit or die, and they say something. Okay, we got something, the file is not writable. Is that something you expect your, your user to find in the code if something doesn't work on the application? No, you expect something at least, well, either it has to be sent to a header so there can be, um, there can be a maintenance uh, page that's being displayed, or not something that's like that, just you know, written and stopped. The other thing I find interesting is there's no way we can understand what's happening there. There's no LDAP, so apparently this is uh, doing something with LDAP. There are security reasons for something. There's an admin system. But just reviewing those error messages could be interesting, give you an idea of how the, the application behaves. If there's none of them because there's no die, that's also good. Okay? Otherwise, there should be something that's more um, interesting. So 
Uh, what, what could be interesting with that? Doing spelling, like collect all the variables and check the spelling. Believe me, you're going to get some work. And not for the foreigner who do not speak English. I think the HTTP for a referer was, uh, was something interesting. Um, the name of the, of the classes is also a good list. Um, so everyone knows the, the magic number syndrome? So it's what I mentioned earlier. When, when you use a number, that actually has some special value, but it's like a little scattered everywhere. You suddenly see something like 20.6. OK, that's French VAT. But you have to know that. If you don't know that, then it's just like, why is this number everywhere? And why is it actually scattered all across the, the place? Right? Shouldn't it be like centered? So when we decide to change it from one to the other, to a new value, that's probably going to change. Then maybe we have it a constant, so it can be changed. Um, the other thing from inventory is, is that we could you know, scan the code and extract information to put that into another, um, uh, it, it, to, to give uh, information to someone else, like all the compilations, um, on the compilation directives. So, for example, you read the code and you find all the functions that are being called. Okay? Given the list of PHP.NET, you can find which are the extensions being used in this application. Okay? So this is, again, on the, the PHP uh, APM. Um, obviously, from the, from the function names, you know which extensions are used. So from the extension are used, you, are, you know the ones that are used, the ones that are not used. And you can decide and offer a list of compilation uh, um, uh, say switch to optimize the PHP code. Right? So from the, from the code, you read it. You have the exact line of code to be uh, compiling PHP and avoid compiling too many extensions. What do we do often, usually? We just you know, apt get and get the standard PHP from someone who decided how it, is, it should be done. And then <clears throat> we end up with having LDAP because, OK, it was kind of default. If we have a security problem, then someone can exploit this LDAP extension to go somewhere else. Okay? So maybe it's interesting to have this list like, automatically extracted and provided to the DevOps. They will decide if they want to uh, compile something specific and update it whenever we need a new extension, or they just you know, want to optimize it for performance. But we don't have to do it. We just have to write the code, and the static analysis will, will provide us the information. The other one that's always very useful is the proactive PHP directive checklist. How many times do you, do you have the system admin comes and say, oh, yeah, your application is running. Which one, which of the directives are important to you? It's like, mm, I don't know. I have my SQL, so compile it. And I have, I don't know, LDAP. That's all. No, if nothing special. No, 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 no. It's OK. And then you come back and say, yeah, it's not working. The upload is not working. Yeah, but you didn't tell me to activate the, the upload. Why? Because there's no list done. You have to think about it to review the whole code. And here, static analysis, analysis can review the code and say, oh, at that point, you're moving an uploaded file, so meaning that you depends on uploading. So I can suggest you that some of the uploading has to be done. And you have to change like three directives, so you can provide the whole list to the, to the system admin. And that's automated. Other usage, I'll be done with those five, um, five different uh, themas. But they are all, all over on the file. New user, new news age for static analysis that are always interesting. Um, for example, a dependency graph. OK. Um, do we have to, de to deal with dependency anymore in PHP? There's autoload, right? No? It's solving a part of the problem. But there's still people doing includes. So maybe there is a, a list of inclusion and a hierarchy of inclusions. Beside that, you have static expressions. You know, when you do a, a constant and you can put, you can mix it with other constants, then suddenly this file depends on other constant to be to be organized, to be uh, defined before we reach the file. So dependencies, there are several of them, and the machine can can find all of them. A namespace graph, that's what you see, kind of blurry at the bottom. Um, that means that. Well, I'll get another one. I'll finish with this one, actually. Uh, depth track. Depth track is a, a static analysis tool that will um, allow you to check there are uh, any um, dependencies that should not happen. So let's say you have MVC, Model View Controller, and you want to avoid that the model is calling the controller directly. 
or the controller is calling actually the database directly. So you will set up a, a rule saying, OK, uh, I do not accept any call to this class from the controller uh, directory. You have to do it yourself. You have to explain explicitly what are the relations you do not want to, to see. And then the machine will take a, take a look at all the classes and say, oh, yeah, at that point you're calling this other method. means you have a coupling between those classes. That's interesting to remove as in terms of dependencies. Taint analysis follow, it's, it's a bit like uh, for the security, it follows the different um, usage of the variable. If it starts with a get, for example, the underscore get, it will just taint all the variables that are using or depending on the get. And then this way you can see which, of, which part of your code is being tainted by you know, a dirty value or, or value that has to be filtered before being used. The final one here, okay, so we said namespace graph, for example. The, the little, the long, lead, the long bar that you've seen is actually the, the composer namespace. So all the composer classes are now in one track. Every, every time there is um, a namespace that acts like a folder, then you have one shade of color. Okay. So the deepest namespace is over there. And you can see that most of the classes inside Composer stay within their own namespace, okay, like their own folder. So here you have like five, six different classes. They all like extend each other inside the namespace. So that's a kind of consistent set of, uh, of classes. On the other hand, when you see here on the side, you can see that there are two different and separate namespaces. And at some point, there is an extension, at least two of them. The other one is on the side. So apparently, there is. The, the namespaces and the classes are well grouped by usage, except for a few of them. Maybe that could be interesting to start looking at those and see why they were either split into different namespaces or made together. Or not, because you don't care. That's also a possibility. So finally, 68, you probably have ideas for more. So you can do your own. You can do your own. You can ask James if you want to do more better. Better. The best initially would be to compile yourself the AST extension. So there is an internal AST uh, in PHP 7, but we do not access it. We use it, but we don't access it, just like we use tokens. Okay. Uh, it's actually a very easy compilation. So just get it, download it, and compile it. And you can, uh, you can have uh, access to that. That will do the heavy work of building the AST. And believe me, it takes time. It's better in PHP 7, but it really takes time. So the AST is probably the best. At least you start with all those definitions. From there, you can probably build the control and the dependency uh, program uh, control graph if you need them. Anyway, if you're still in PHP 5, there is a parser that emulates the behavior of PHP 7 AST into PHP 5. So you don't need to move to PHP 7. It's probably going to be a lot better for you to do that, but you can still rely on that. There are well, some of the parser I have mentioned uh, earlier are using PHP uh, parser, so that, that's a good uh, good project. <coughs> better reflection also. Um, does does PHP still rely on that? Um, no. Okay. <coughs> I thought so. My bad. Okay, it's a native one. So you see, uh, it did its own. <laughs> um, in in um, in spite of if if you are. If you really have no tools or you have no time, the good old regex still works. Okay? I used to be campaigning against it. That's a bad idea, but I actually find myself doing that a lot. Anytime you have a keyword search in your code, don't, don't break a sweat. No time for static analysis. Just you know, grab, find, that will be sufficient. On the other hand, if you're trying to look for, I don't know, static calls to methods and you only rely on the double column, yeah, go and use a static analyzer because regex is not going to work. No, okay, whatever. So um, you can also fork an existing tool to my experience at the moment, except maybe using better reflection. Um, it's kind of difficult to go inside the tool, but maybe they have already laid the work, the hard work for you. So if you take a look, that can be a, a good source of information. So to write that, we have now a number of tools. Do you need ideas? Here are a number of ideas, things that have not been done. At least I'm not aware of them. So I can give that to you if you're interested, or if you know about them, I'm interested in that. The thing that surprises me is that we can start, we are starting to do some static analysis for PHP. And beside maybe Symfony, I know no other um, 
I don't know all the framework that actually provides uh, static analysis. And that's actually very useful. You have users, what do you provide them with? Okay, manual. So they have to read the manual, understand it, and use it. If you have a set of good recommendations, you know, best practices, recommendations, things like that, you could actually rely on static analysis to review beginner's code or customer's code and say, okay, I can review that. I give you an audit of the code and say, there and there and there, you should do that the other way. The way we recommend is this way. Take a look at the WordPress uh, documentation. I actually have to say it's there. There are recommendations. It's just scattered all across the, the documentations. Um, they re usually recommend that you should not use other uh, globals than the one they provide, and they, you should not modify them. Okay? That kind of things can be ta statically checked. We can look in the code and say, oh, yeah, at that point, you have made some modifications. That should not be done. That's going to help in terms of consistency across your users and in terms of eff efficiency. So anytime you have like models or partnerships that's providing some code and you send them to a marketplace, you can review that before being, being, uh, being produced, being published. That's an interesting one. So if you are editing a framework, I'm interested to talk with you about that. But in general, um, class diagram extractors, if you really want to have a UML from the code that exists, could be interesting. Um, what that? Oh, yeah. 40% of every code is basically static. Am I losing that? Yeah. That's actually by reading so much code, um, you realize that most of the code itself, less than half of PHP code is static. Now, let me, let me think about that. Imagine that you have a property that will hold the number of versions. Okay? This is not going to change during the execution. Okay? But since it's an array, and you're not aware that PHP 7 accepts arrays as constant, then you probably push that into, a, into property. <coughs> now, it looks like you have dynamic code, right? Because you're manipulating a property that's that should be changing, but this property is never accessed for modification. It's, it's really a constant. It doesn't look like a constant. But that still makes a large part of your code all the same, because any loops there is on this array will actually be just read something that never changed, so it's actually a constant, and the wall of it is a constant. It looks like some you know, macro we would do in C. And we would probably make the code look very different if we understand which of those constants are really constant and then have to look like constants. Anyway, that's not done yet. Um, coding references also. That may be in-house, or that may be something you take from outside. There are lots of people who try to say, OK, if you want to do, go be a good programmer, do like this, do like that, do like this. Okay. And if we like two of them in the same room, that's going to be an endless war, right? I would call that an argument. But, um, but usually, I'm, I think it's important that every team has its own list of them. Okay? Currently, in Exacat, I have around 300 different analyses. Don't try to trust them all at the same time. Okay? That's too much. Choose at least 10 of them. And I don't have all of them. I have a to-do list of 2,000 lines. So I'm completely far away from, from, from the end. So, just select 10 of them, 10 that are important, that may be specific of your application or your team and the way you work. You don't want to hear about globals. OK, make it one rule and statically enforce that. You don't need to review that yourself. You just run the test, one line appears, you get blame, and we talk about it. That's all. You don't need to do 300 uh, tests at the same time. <coughs> so to finish, please never code alone again. Because with that kind of tool, you're actually inviting experts in your own programmation. Okay? Even as a side project, you want to review the code and not be the only one checking it, then Static Analyzer will give you a feedback, and then you can deal with it. And believe me, when you write on a Static Analyzer yourself, you learn how to be humble. How many times do I look at site and say, oh, hey, this is stupid code. They, that should not be done. Like, try harder. Ever, try, ever seen that? You know, people try, try block, and they say, do something, catch, OK, do something. They really want to try. So you look at that, it's like, oh, that's stupid. But then you check on your own code and realize, ooh, I'm doing the same. <laughs> so let's, let's fix that first, and then we publish that. So if you're working even alone or in a team, that could be interesting to be not the only one. You can, you can ex uh, import experience from outside 
and, and have some feedback on your code, even without asking, and, and even doing that you know, on your own cubicle and not sharing that. So if, if you feel like you're ashamed of it, no one will know. No one will know. Um, other thing, you can prepare for the future with that. Okay, as I mentioned, for example, we can prepare for PHP 7.2. We don't know where it goes, we don't know why or when, but we have already a number of things that we can prepare now. So uh, static analysis for that is interesting. You don't have to wait for the version to be ready. Just prepare for the future. Otherwise, well, you will learn. Maybe select one rule, one of the numerous, numerous rules that are available, fix them all, and when you're done, then consider it's a rule, a static fixed rule, and then move on, learn something else. Don't try to be, <laughs> don't try to learn all of them at the same time because that's not going to work. And that will be it. Um, how often do you run, do you analyze your code? Like, are you <laughs> automating it with a commit hook, or is okay. it something you're manually doing? And That's a good one. Um, I would say two different experiences. Uh, for example, PHP Stan is going to run on my code on a few minutes, so I can do that anytime I want. Uh, my own code will run in 20 minutes on my, on my world code, so I don't do that all the time. Okay? The other thing I know is that even with a long report and a number of broken, broken down uh, sections, I can usually keep the report uh, viable for a whole week, meaning I run it on Monday. By Friday, I will end up with a number of you know, problems with lines. But the, the insights, the fact that I should take a look at, at that part of the code is still valid. So I don't need more than that. Okay? Uh, so the di different tools will be available for a Git hook if you want to run something very fast like PHP lint. Yeah, please do that on the Git hook. That's, that's a good thing. Um, there are other tools that will not fit because it means that you have to understand the code a lot more and it will run for a much longer time. So I would say there are, there are tools, yeah, depending on what you want to find, uh, there are different tools. Any more questions? Anyone else? Okay, I guess it's social time now. Thank you.